Good morning. Thank you for joining us for Literacy Now, a virtual discussion on the critical role of early literacy. I'm Caroline True. And I'm Ashley Knust. We're the co-chairs of this event. Thank you to all of our sponsors, hosts, and supporters, many of which signed up to support our luncheon that was scheduled for April 22nd. We wanna thank Shaysby, Helen and Sandy Watkins, The Bloody Buddy, Bloody Mary Drink, Harrell Investment Partners, Jennifer Lynch, the author of Livy and Grace, and Plains Capital Bank. We are grateful for your belief in the work of Literacy First and coming alongside us as we've transitioned into a virtual panel discussion. We are proud to bring you a timely and important conversation today about early literacy. As a reminder, this is a webinar. We will not see your faces or hear you. However, please be aware of the chat and Q&A features. The chat feature will be monitored by staff in case of any technical challenges. If you need any assistance or have comments, this is where we will share links that will be referenced as well. The Q&A feature will be used to gather questions you may have throughout this virtual event. We will do our very best to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the session. Those that we do not get to will be sure to answer in any follow-up after the event. This event is being recorded and will be shared with you and those that were not able to attend today. Literacy First teaches young children in K through second grade how to read so they can read to learn for the rest of their lives. Today, you're going to hear from experts in the field of reading and education, practitioners and funders alike. It's an important topic as we look ahead to an uncertain future and how we can support an organization that we believe has the secret sauce for making sure all of our students are successful. I hope you will be inspired to join us in investing in Literacy First. Now, without further ado, please welcome Marisol Foster, Executive Director of the Weber Family Foundation right here in Austin, who is our moderator. Thank you, Ashley and Caroline. I appreciate that. And thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm really glad to be here with this panel of experts as we take a deep dive and explore the critical issue of early literacy. Today, we're gonna to hear about how Literacy First and its community partners are responding to the pandemic, as well as how the need for their work will undoubtedly increase once schools reopen. For the past 26 years, Literacy First has been providing an effective early literacy intervention program to Central Texas kiddos and schools that predominantly serve vulnerable kids. In that time, they've built a proven track record in ensuring that striving readers build strong foundational skills by the end of third grade or by the end of second grade, which we know sets students on a path to thrive in school and in life. Through the foundation, I have been extremely privileged to work with Literacy First over 15 years, and I wholly believe in this program. I believe in its thoughtful leadership, its strong partnerships, I believe in its deep roots and best practices, as well as its ability to innovate. I also believe that Literacy First and its partners are well prepared to be able to address the growing and changing early literacy needs, which are going to be now more important than ever. So with that, let's get to it. We have um, a great group for you all today, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you all to our talented panel here. Um, the list of their accomplishments and their fields of expertise are way too many to mention here today. So I'll simply introduce them with their titles, but I would encourage you to visit the Literacy First website so that you can take a look at their full bios. So panelists, if you would, just please give us a quick wave as I introduce you, um, that would be great. With us today is Ellen Arnold. Ellen is the principal of Arnold Public Affairs and a Literacy First advisory board member. Helen Dunn Garcia is the principal at Hornsby Dunlop Elementary School in Del Valley ISD. Ilsa Garcia is the administrative supervisor of dyslexia and literacy for Austin ISD. Dr. Mary Ellen Isaacs, the director and fierce liter leader of Literacy First. And then last but certainly not least is Virginia Potter, the portfolio director at the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. So thank you all so much for being here with us today. So to kick things off, I thought I'd start with Ilsa, and I wonder if you could just give us a little bit of context 
As a literacy expert for Austin ISD, you really know firsthand the important role that literacy plays in building strong foundations for young learners. Um, from what you see, what are the early literacy challenges that our schools are facing today? Yes, thank you. So our biggest priority is always equity um, for our students across the district, especially with early literacy, since we know that there's you know, plenty of research showing that if that foundation is not strong, then literacy gets more complicated and students have less access to the high levels of thinking that they will need to to engage in throughout their educational uh, career and life, ultimately. Um, it's the foundation of all, almost every educational experience. And we want all of our students to be able to read and interpret texts and their world really in personalized ways. Um, so to accomplish this, we think of, of literacy as multi-layered. Reading and writing, for example, can't just live in a language arts classroom. Uh, so we ask, questions like how can we integrate literacy experiences into our content area instruction and, and how can we make sure that every subject is a literacy experience? Um, how can we make the content accessible to our students with special needs? Even early on, we can see when students uh, are struggling to develop phonological awareness, for example, and we're fine tuning how to make teachers and staff aware of these nuances so that they can early on implement practices to, to bring them up to speed and make sure that they are accessing the same content as their peers. Um, we also view support for reading and writing skills as layered and try to find multiple ways to address student needs. Um, we wanna make sure that every child receives the kinds of support that they need to access text and experience literacy at high cognitive levels so we work with staff to screen and diagnose students to group them effectively uh, and make sure that the time that they are spent with intervention is purposeful um, and goes seamlessly with everything else that they're doing throughout the school day. But um, as we're seeing right now, this situation with the pandemic has really amplified uh, the issue of equity in our district because we are seeing that many of our students are not able to access a device or not able to check in with their teachers. Um, and, and it's just highlighted that issue. So our role is to try to reduce that uh, predictability um, of students failing or not able to access text um, and with a multifaceted, multi-layered approach. Um, mm -hmm. Other, we can't control whether a student has a device, but the district is trying to get students devices. And I know that they have limited the capacity to do that. So they've chosen, you know, grade levels to do that for. Um, but aside from that, we try to um, show teachers and families the literacy experiences that they can engage in, uh, despite not being able to go to school or sit in with their teachers virtually at this time. That's just one small example. Um, part of our literacy framework is beyond the school day. It's, it's three, uh, it has three components inside the language arts classroom, throughout the school day and beyond the school day. So we are constantly trying to promote literacy experiences that go beyond the classroom. We purchase digital resources that students can access at any point. We try to publicize uh, experiences and events and contests that students can participate in beyond the school walls. Um, and while they are in school, we try to make sure that they know that their experiences are valid, they are important, they are worth sharing, um, that their meaning making needs to be that needs to stem from their personal interests. We know engagement is key. Um, if they're not connecting with what we're doing at school, they're not gonna be engaged and we're gonna lose them. And that is another uh, way we can uh, improve equity of access. Um, yeah. We don't want to further widen the gap. Uh, and that's really tricky, especially at a time like this. Sorry, go ahead, you were starting to say. No, no, that's all, I was agreeing with you. You're absolutely right. This pandemic has really created some added layers of challenges for everybody. And 
Um, and I appreciate you sharing that with us. Mary Ellen, you've been involved for literacy work for, for more than four decades. What's your take? Why, why is this so difficult to solve? Oh, Mary Ellen, I think you're on mute. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Marisol. Sure. Um, so we know this is a huge challenge, not for our region as well as nationally. Um, you hear a lot about uh, the struggle of making sure all kids read well in the early grades. And here in Central Texas, only about 50% of our students overall meet expectations on the third grade star reading test. And for children of color and children living in poverty, that number is even lower about 27 to 39%. And that's over 12,000 students in our communities whose futures are limited by low literacy. Um, these achievement gaps have been persistent for decades, but you might be surprised how quickly these gaps can grow. Um, there, is a, um, there is a graph that I like to show that really demonstrates um, these achievement gaps, and I'm not sure we're gonna be able to show it. Um, there we go. So um, this, uh, I think this really illustrates beautifully what um, Ilsa spoke to, and that is that that blue line represents um, students who come to school with the kinds of experiences that match the curriculum and, and they've had access to rich early childhood experiences and they're ready to meet the curriculum and they take off in kindergarten. And in first grade is a really transitional year. And um, once students have begun to master um, those foundational reading skills, they really can take off and they read more and they get better at it. In contrast, students who haven't had access to some of those um, early childhood experiences that might prepare them for school, um, when they start kindergarten, they're already behind and, and our um, data shows that they're behind as much as um, six months to a year when we start working with them. And if those gaps are left unattended, you can see how quickly it widens. So by third grade, that's almost insurmountable. Uh, in fact, about 80% of students that haven't achieved grade level by uh, third grade will probably never fully catch up to their peers. And so um, these are smart, capable kids. And these gaps really reflect disparities in access, not ability. And so the challenge is that we have a relatively short window of time to close this gap. First grade achievement predicts ninth grade achievement with alarming accuracy. Um, I sometimes tell our stakeholders that Literacy First is really a college access program. Um, people are surprised because after all, we work with five to eight year olds. But if we don't fix this, um, then we really are limiting students' future and access to higher education as well. But the good news is that we really do know what to do. There's ample research and evidence on the power of early intervention, and this is really our mission. Um, and we achieve this just in, in I'm just going to highlight three key ways. Um, we have an intensive focus on the skills that matter most based on the science of teaching reading, and our tutoring is intensive. We work one-to-one -one with every student we serve every day for 20 to 30 minutes. And um, before the pandemic hit, we have worked with a, a total of about 1,300 students across our three district partners. Um, we engage highly trained tutors. They get over 70 hours of training and weekly on-site support, and they work full-time in the schools. And then we are really data-driven in everything that we do. Um, this graph is an example of a graph that we have on every child. Um, the red uh, indicates errors and the green indicates correct responses. And the black line is where the child starts and where they need to get to to be considered on grade level. And so what we wanna see is that that red line goes down and that the child accelerates along that line or above that line. And then when they reach grade level, which is why those dots stop, they graduate from the program and we're able to pick up another child. And we have evidence that this really works. This careful weekly monitoring of their progress allows us to individualize lessons and really um, determine where students are. A small number of students don't respond well to the intervention, and then we are able to refer those children to the reading specialist at the school for further evaluation for potential learning difficulties. Um, 
We know that this is working. We've had multiple evaluations, including a randomized control trial that shows that Literacy First really does accelerate students' reading. We know students sustain their gains after they leave the program and do do better um, a year or two later on the state assessments in reading and in math, um, because math does involve a lot of reading. Um, I, I really appreciate what Ilsa said, that we need to be prepared to provide multiple layers of support. Um, we're proud to be a partner in that, um, but th this really is the crux of the challenge facing, um, facing the um, success of all of the students in our community. Can I add something, Mary Ellen? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that I really appreciate how Literacy First um, work with our view of multilingual students and bilingual students. There are in education still many misconceptions about the learning trajectory of students learning in multiple languages. And Literacy First is one of the layers of support that includes, and I would say that elevates Spanish, which is the other majority language that many of our students live and breathe. Um, it is not viewed as simply a vehicle for learning English. Um, and with Literacy First, they bring in tutors often who look and sound like the students that they're working with. And that is crucial for, for our students um, navigating two languages. Um, and then the very specific layer of support that Literacy First provides really is a seamless part of a school's comprehensive plan to get uh, students' needs met. I've heard teachers say, Oh, okay. Well, you know, this student needs just a little bit more help with fluency, and thank goodness they have we have them going to literacy first. It, it's just one more thing uh, that the students have access to, and in two languages, which is very hard to find yeah. in our world. Um, we want students to know that they, you know, that their language is just as important as English, um, and that there are people using it in their careers, just like they will one day. So um, thank you for that. Thank you, Ilsa, for adding into that. That's, um, that's very helpful to hear your perspective. The data that you shared, Mary Ellen, is, is really compelling. It's always one of my favorite parts during our visits with you is to see that just that line go up. Um, and it's, it's always so interesting to see how you all are measuring and tracking your outcomes. Um, it seems like a lot of the work that you all lead together with your partners are, are really high touch. There's a lot of intensity and frequency involved with working with, with your students. And in this environment, we're currently living in a low or no touch um, phase. So I'm wondering, you know, how has COVID already affected early literacy work this year? And then looking forward, sort of what, what should we expect in terms of student needs after this is behind us? And I'll throw that out to Marianne or Elsa. Well, um, first of all, I would like to just give a huge shout out to all of the district leaders um, across the nation and right here in Austin and teachers who have turned on a dime and pivoted to online instruction, often with just a week or so themselves to prepare for a whole new way of teaching. Um, this is really unprecedented shift in public education and I'm, I'm amazed and inspired by um, what educators are doing. I think any of you listening who are parents working at home and managing your own children's schooling understand how devastating this pandemic is to students who don't have access to technology. And as Ilsa said, that's a very large percentage of our students. So I think um, if you look, think about that graph of the achievement gaps, just you know, make that gap bigger right from the beginning and that's going to be the impact of the pandemic. Some education experts have predicted that children are losing as much as two years um, in this time of school interruption. And for our students who were typically already six months to a year behind, the impact of, that pan of the pandemic is really significant. Um, as Ilsa said, every dist and every district we partner with is making every effort to get devices to all students. Um, and I really believe this is a community issue. <clears throat> Schools can't do it all. I recently read an article about how internet access should be like electricity. We should expect to build the infrastructure for universal access because right now, poor kids are disproportionately affected by these gaps. 
Um, it was a challenge before COVID-19 and the stakes are much higher now. Um, so we are prepared to lend our full strength to this effort with our district partners. Yeah, I you think, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go right ahead, Elsa. Um, I think that it, is, it does, it, for our educators, it, it posed a challenge too, because with um, early literacy, we don't discourage use of technology, but we know that students respond better to human interaction. And so I think it was a very quick turnaround mm -hmm. that teachers had to engage in. And so all of our departments were providing support on how do you facilitate learning um, asynchronously and synchronously with your students. Um, and as a parent, I, I have uh, seen that um, students can do, you know, some literacy work mm -hmm. on a cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's probably what most people would have access to if they do have access to technology. Yeah. So I think yeah. our teachers have done a great job um, in Texas mm -hmm. adapting to that and finding what is something that is more likely to be picked up by <clears throat> a young student and their parent and what is manageable at this time. Yeah, yeah, that's the, sort of the silver lining here is, mm -hmm. you know, it's been interesting to see how really overnight schools and districts have taken this challenge to develop new and innovative ways to reach and teach kids that may have otherwise taken decades. So, um, so yes, great points to mention, thank you. Um, Ellen, I'd like to turn to you. You have a unique perspective as a government affairs consultant. Uh, we know that in 2019, historic legislation was passed through HB3, partly aimed at improving early reading practices. So in your opinion, how does this work across the state really support what Literacy First is doing locally? Oh, and Ellen, you're on mute. There you go. Thank you, Marisol. Sure, you're welcome. With the passage of HB3, policymakers really joined hands, I think, with early learning experts like Mary Ellen Isaacs and her team, acknowledging finally that early literacy is really the key to starting students on a path to success in school and life. We know that students who are not able to read by third grade are much more likely to drop out of school. HB3 is historic because it approaches the challenge of literacy for all with a focus on several key levers to ensure that teachers have the skills that they need and the support that they need to teach our students to read well by third grade and to ensure that children have early access to that critical instruction. So the new law requires that all school districts and charter schools begin to provide full day pre-K to students in at-risk environments, including those who live in families of low income and whose first language is not English. Uh, HB3 requires training for primary grade teachers on the science of teaching reading, something that sort of over the last couple of decades has slid to the side in um, instruction in universities for teachers. It offers school districts an option to participate in a program to identify their most effective teachers and reward them with higher salaries, and with priority placement in early grades rather than at grades where state testing happens. And also it focuses on assigning those teachers to high needs campuses. There are also requirements at the university level for improving teacher preparation. And we believe that will ensure that all teachers of primary grades understand the science of teaching reading. I'm hopeful and I'm excited that Texas is moving in the right direction with the passage of HB3 hopeful because policymakers are more focused on our most vulnerable students and excited because I believe that this is the moment for which Literacy First has been preparing for the last several years. Because the truth of the matter is that even with the focus in HB3 on literacy by third grade, programs like Literacy First will continue to be necessary to support the work in the classroom. The need is simply too great. So Mary Ellen and her team have been exploring ways to replicate the program more broadly without losing fidelity, without losing the key components that make the program work. And it's taken time and a lot of thinking outside the box. But this magnificent team has done that work and they're piloting a new model in Del Valley ISD that we'll be talking about later in the program. And there, Literacy First is training the Del Valley staff to implement their instructional model and is building their capacity to ensure strong reading outcomes. And it's a model 
that is scalable to other school districts across the state of Texas. Yeah, thanks. Helen, you're a school leader in Del Valley ISD. Can you share your experience working with Literacy First for the past two years? And specifically, if you could focus on the new partnership and how it's impacted your campus and your, and your teachers. Um, yeah, so um, I first got to Del Valley ISD um, two years ago, and I think we got a, an email or a text message asking um, if anybody would like to pilot a program with Literacy First, and I jumped on it. Um, as a new principal, I had been in other districts and worked with Literacy First before um, and ha had seen the partnerships they developed with um, teachers and students. And so I probably answered back in about 30 seconds because I was just, um, as a new principal, wanting that um, for selfishly for my campus and my students. And so I jumped at it and the partnership began and it's been wonderful. Um, last year, we had 79 students that went through the program, K through second, 53 of those students graduated. And so that means that they are on um, grade level, leaving their grade, which is super exciting. So that means 53 students that are steps closer to not becoming that statistic of, um, you know, the 75% of kiddos that don't read by third grade or aren't fluent readers by third grade who don't catch up. And so those kiddos are no longer um, in, that, in that group. They also are more confident. Um, they've built relationships with the tutors. Unfortunately for us, the piloting that we have done here is that we have moved to training in-house. So the staff members that um, are working with our students are actually staff members that are here and part of Del Valley. Um, a few of our uh, tutors are actually living in the community. So they have, um, uh, they have, they're extremely invested in the school and the community. And so those partnerships ha have been wonderful. Um, they are, you know, devoted members of the Hornsby family and Del the Del Valley family. So um, it's just been really amazing um, that we've built this partnership. And from the, from the get go, I have, um, also evolved as an administrator um, with the data meetings and things like that that we'll talk about. But um, it's been a great partnership, and I'm really excited to see um, how it, it unfolds in the next few years. And I hopefully that um, Literacy First is around for a long time to support my students and my staff. Yeah, yeah, that's that is the goal, and to give it to more students who need it. The real question here is, is around scalability and how do you continue to bring this solution and, and literacy first vision to all children in our region? So I'll turn to Ellen and ask that question. If you could just briefly share scalability, how do we do this? Well, it's so important, Marisol, that we make this program available more broadly. As a former elementary school principal, I know with all certainty for students who do not come to school ready to learn that literacy first is that lifeline. And I can't say it more emphatically, um, the skills that it teaches change the trajectory, the life tra trajectory of, of children. Our literacy first team has developed and is fine tuning an effective model in Del Valley that can be re replicated with fidelity. The partnership between Literacy First and school leaders is absolutely essential to that success. And this model is less expensive than the traditional one-on-one -on -one tutoring program that costs roughly $1,500 per student. It trains teachers, school staff, and adults from the school community to deliver research-based and comprehensive reading intervention. And it provides ongoing support and feedback and data consultancy that teaches teachers how to use data to inform their instruction. With this model, we're not only giving young children the skills that they need to be successful in school, but we are growing the number of literacy experts one school at a time. The missing component though, frankly, is funding. We're looking for opportunities to partner with the state to deliver the program more broadly. I'll be honest and say that given our current budget crisis and uh, the Texas Education's agencies laser focus on delivering education in the age of COVID-19, that this will likely be a long-term project um, that may not come to fruition in the next year or two. And in the meantime, reaching more children is dependent on increasing private funding. Yeah, so true. Helen, is there anything you'd quickly like to add on before I move to the next? 
Well, Ellen hit a lot of the points about, um, you know, looking at data. Um, it has a huge effect because often we look at the upper grades where there's testing, there's star testing. And so we, as administrators, we, we have to reach our goals, right? We have to get kids, you know, to pass those tests. It's super important for us and our accountability, but sometimes that takes resources from our little kids. And so it, did, it didn't make any sense. So for us um, in Del Valley and here at my campus, it's retraining our thought and really um, putting all of those efforts into our little kids so that we don't have to um, you know, stress about our older kids who could possibly be readers. And so um, those data meetings became an important and essential part of what we were doing here at Hornsby, we shifted our thinking to having those conversations with teachers um, and the accountability in that having those data meetings and getting to know our kids. Because if you sat in one of those data meetings with tutors, you're thinking, wow, this is a paraprofessional who really knows reading and, um, and is able to talk about kids like they are you know, certified teachers and that was eye-opening for our staff um, just to see that our paraprofessionals had such in-depth, great training with Literacy First that we even looked at ourselves and, you know, great with the House, with House Bill 3 passing, that's going to be huge for us. And, you know, taking that shift and really investing in our teachers. And I've um, been a big advocate and Mary Ellen, I've gone to, uh, her people and said, how do I get literacy first training for my teachers? <laughs> and I, I've been and I've been saying that for the last two years. I'm like, I need my teachers. How can you know we get them trained through literacy first? Because um, like you know, Ellen said, our teachers aren't really trained anymore how to really be reading teachers or how to really diagnose kids and see what's going on with their reading. And so um, I don't know if I answered the question because I was I just got so excited, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm excited about House Bill 3. I'm excited about still partnering with Literacy First and hoping some of that funding rolls in and, and can help support um, the Literacy First program. Yeah, I think many are excited to partner with Literacy First and we look forward to seeing what sort of opportunities come to surface as as, um, as time goes on. But I'd like to pivot now just a little bit and get the perspective of a Literacy First funder. Virginia, in your 10 years of championing hundreds of programs in Central Texas and across the globe, how does Literacy First stand out to you as an effective program that addresses early literacy issues? Yeah, the good question. Um, we're uh, you know, the Michael Zizendel Foundation has, um, over the last couple years, really expanded our focus from being solely K-12 to really backing that up on, on both ends of the spectrum and thinking about um, children and students' journeys from infancy all the way through career. And so we're looking for leaders and organizations that are results-oriented, um, super adaptable and really think beyond their four walls um, and, and taking responsibility for being such instrumental contributors to the community. Um, and in particular with Literacy First, when I talked to our leadership team about uh, Mary Ellen and her awesome team and the results that they're getting with students in the community, I always talk about um, how pivotal a point um, literacy first is in a student's journey, really starting from such an absolute early age and setting them off on the right track. Um, and they're able to do so, execute their program so beautifully um, while helping students, engaging the tutors that we've heard about, working with teachers, the entire, you know, with principals like Helen, and um, also engaging um, community members, which is amazing to cultivate that type of, um, or, you know, buy-in from community um, residents to help children along the way. And I think that the, the other part of this, when I talk about organizations that are um, are very interested in thinking about the effects of their work beyond their four walls, their virtual walls, especially now. Um, I'm talking also about secondary benefits. And so 
Um, Literacy First has an amazing partnership, as many of you know, with the region, um, with Region 13 and in, in creating alternative certification programs for many of their tutors to carry on and become teachers. And we all know how many we need teachers. We need good teachers and folks interested in that career. Um, and so I think that the way that uh, Mary Ellen and team really take ownership of this space and really consider the, the whole journey of a child, even though they're working with them from K through two, the effects that you heard Mary Ellen talk about earlier um, that Literacy First and the team has are, are long lasting. And that's very appealing to us. Yeah, I, I think that's very well said, Virginia. Those, those ripple effects of this work reach really far and wide. And, um, mm-hmm. and that's something that we also find extremely appealing and compelling about this work. Um, mm-hmm. Mary Ellen, we are in a climate where survivability seems to be like the new sustainability. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about whether or not schools will be opening in the fall and if they're going to possibly have future temporary school closures. And I wonder if you can share with us a little bit about how Literacy First is planning to serve kids in the future. Sure. Yeah, I'm, and the only thing that's certain right now is uncertainty. So right. um, we know we have to be flexible and we know we have to be prepared to support schools in, in different ways, potentially. So this spring, um, we did learn that their virtual tutoring is absolutely possible. Um, when students have access to a computer and internet, our tutors were able to pivot to working virtually and in Del Valley, um, uh, those tutors whose students were connected have been doing virtual tutoring and we've been able to get that going in two of our other schools as well. Um, So as we think about the different scenarios being discussed by districts to open schools, we know that we can adapt to do our work in each of these scenarios, whether it's in person or whether it's virtual. We also see in our future, our immediate future, um, being ready to do some outreach and work with parents is another way that we can support virtual learning. Um, Making sure that we have things right at the beginning of the school that we can send home, that we can maybe engage parents in some um, webinars themselves, Zoom meetings about things that they can do at home uh, with their students. Um, Our tutors have created some packets for fun games that parents can do and things that that might be accessible as an additional support because we know that parents were really thrown into a teaching role um, with as as little notice as teachers were given (laughs) to go virtual. Um, And as part of our strategic planning, we're already looking at ways to reach more students um, and these become more urgent in the current situation. Um, We are uh, doing planning to begin to provide some training to teachers in our interventions that they can use in small groups and that will expand our impact. Sharing our bilingual curriculum more widely to support biliteracy um, and continuing to engage adults from our school communities in this work. I think a lot of low wage earners are going to be especially hard hit by Mm COVID-19 and I think um, a year as a or two as a tutor with us can really be um, a jump start um, to new potential for a lot of um, adults in our community. But uh, we are ready to engage fully and um, we are actively working with several partners around the connectivity issue as well, um, because we know that that's going to be crucial to fully reach kids. Yeah, the, the, not only the devices, but the actual connectivity is, yeah. is really important. I can't even imagine how challenging any type of planning has been when there are so many unknown variables right now. Um, so I'll, I'll turn to Helen or Ilsa and ask if there's anything else you wish more people knew about your partnership with Literacy First and the issues that you guys are looking at solving together right now. Uh, Marisol, one of the things that I wanted to add was, you know, when speaking about um, the buy-in, you know, and having and the piloting that we did here, the buy-in of our tutors Um, The difference, you know, uh, it has come up with AmeriCorps versus our in-house trained people is that um, I think with AmeriCorps, and it's been years since I've seen that model in a different district, but um, with AmeriCorps volunteers, they move on, you know, they, um, they, their life, you know, they do their time in the, in in the program and they go. Um, For us, what we're seeing is their community members and um, 
their tutors are um, getting paid a really great wage. And so they're invested. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, one of the great things of our pilot and our programming here in, in Zell Valley. Um, and I'm thankful for our new superintendent who brought the program here um, because we, our people are invested in our students and, you know, they're part of the community. So it's in their best interest to see our kids grow. And um, that was one thing I wanted to add, because I think that some people think, well, what's, you know, are asking, well, what's the difference? Why is this different than what they're doing in a different district? And um, for us, it's really um, having highly trained people who are, who are staying and they're become a part of our culture. Yeah. I can add something as well. Um, I saw a question about uh, the effectiveness of this for dyslexia uh, in one mm -hmm. of the Q&A and uh, take flight was mentioned. Um, I just wanted to say that literacy success takes many different components and uh, reading is, is an experience that includes many different isolated skills that need to come together. And all of the programs that we use in our schools are complementary of each other to allow the students to access the text that, that they are required to read. Sorry, my son is talking. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to clarify that Literacy First is, is a tier two or three support that students receive with very focused um, components of literacy. And then if we have a student in going with a literacy first tutor and they're not seeing the progress that we would like to see that other students have shown in the same uh with the same intervention that is a sign that they need something more intensive like take flight and so i appreciate that literacy first has these ongoing data meetings to look at everything that that their children are uh, using in the classroom um, including their social emotional well-being, their family life, their what it, what is school like during the day for them? What is it like after school? Um, <clears throat> what kinds of things are going on in their life? How should we use that to inform our decisions? Mm -hmm. All of that is complementary of of it. And actually, we have, I think, I have seen some students who we don't see them progressing as they should be in literacy first, and it's just another helpful piece of data for us to then get them what they need and sometimes right. that is take flight or basic language skills or therapy level intervention so it's very much um an orchestrated uh, attempt at figuring out what students need narrowing down the possibilities and then getting them that intervention and making changes as needed um right formatively assessing them all the time right right I, I hear you both saying more of this, some diversity in the types of assessments um, and more teacher training. And so, yes, that's something that is, is critical. And this is a great segue for, for the next and last question, um, which I'll, I'll throw to Virginia first. Um, and just, if you will, pretend like you have a crystal ball and tell us <laughs> what does the future look like for you for the students and teachers in the communities that you all serve yeah that crystal ball sure would come in handy wouldn't it, it would <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> well i can say that no matter what the reality uh is like uh literacy first is going to going to be the same adaptive thoughtful strategic organization that it is today. And that's only going to continue to evolve and get better from where I sit. Um, they play such an amazingly critical role in helping students uh, learn to read. And that is essential for everything that we do. Um, Mary Ellen even called out um, how important it is with math. Uh, the, you know, Literacy First, as much as it's doing to um, serve as many children as possible. We all know that, you know, they're only meeting a fraction of the demand uh, for their services because they do a, such a great job. So the fact that uh, Mary Ellen and team and then the partners we've heard from today are willing to take a risk to try new things and find ways to not only address the problem with a magnificent intervention that works, so helping intervene early to get students on the right track, 
But on top of that, adding in this layer of, okay, how can we build um, build up um, extra um, support and highly trained folks in our community. You heard Helen talk about that. They're not going to leave, which is great. <laughs> so that is something that's a combination of really being able to hone in on um, leveraging a sound intervention, but also building that scalability. So it's something that's super long lasting and sticky in our community and region uh, for a long time to come. And so I know that Literacy First, in my crystal ball, they are going to continue on that path um, in, in truly being able to not only address the issue at hand of reading, but also relative uh, to providing opportunities for workforce like we've talked about with the uh, paraprofessionals and the tutors um, who go on, can go on to be teachers even. And then really, truly, I, I believe that the effect of this program on student uh, resilience will just continue to make them better people in our community in the future. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. That's, thank you for sharing, Virginia. Ellen, do you have a crystal ball? <laughs> do have a crystal ball and mine uh, gave me two criteria that are going to determine uh, our success or failure. One of them is uh, if we can maintain the focus and the funding on literacy by third grade at the state level. And if we can grow the financial support for literacy first that we need in order to reach more children, whether it be through one-on-one -on -one tutoring or through teacher and community uh, <laughs> training and support, then I believe we will be part of a future in which Texas has a stronger workforce, a workforce that is better prepared, whose members have the skills to continue to learn and grow in their jobs and their careers, and that leads to the economy. Mm -hmm. And remember, the work of Literacy First has a generational impact. Children who learn to read are more confident and more successful in school. They are more likely to graduate from high school. As adults, they are better able to support their families and their children are much less likely to drop out of school. Literacy is fundamental and the work takes all of us. We hope you'll join us. Yeah, thank you, Ellen. Literacy First is certainly fundamental to our future. It's I thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's been a great thought provoking conversation so far and I'm sure it has sparked many questions, um, but to be respectful of everyone's time, I'm not sure that we have enough time to answer any questions here with us here today. Um, so, but the Literacy First team will be working really hard over the coming days to make sure to respond to individual questions that have been submitted through the chat function. Um, but I'd like to just turn it over to Mary Ellen Isaacs to share a little bit more with us about how you all and we together can help Literacy First achieve its goals. Thank you, Marisol, and thank you to all of the panelists. I appreciate each one of you. We have a big vision to truly transform literacy outcomes for young students in Central Texas and beyond. And we are already planning to expand to more schools in the coming year, but we know that the response to COVID-19 will require even more. We will need to be nimble. We will be, need to be able to pivot to new modes of instruction that will allow us to reach significantly more students. And that requires that we build our capacity. Um, I wanted to take just a moment to explain why we're at UT Austin. We are a self-funded program of the University of Texas at Austin at the Charles A. Dana Center. We're very proud to be a program of the Dana Center. Uri Treisman, who's the director of the Dana Center, co-founded this program. Uh, the year AmeriCorps began in Texas, we're the longest running AmeriCorps program in the state. And he funded it um, because he believed the university had an obligation to engage people in service to the community and to use the resources of the, of the university. Um, our funding, uh, we are self-funded. And what that means is we benefit greatly from the infrastructure of the university, but we do not receive any operating dollars from the university. So 100% of our budget we raise every year. Um, about 40% comes right now from our partnership with AmeriCorps that allows us to engage a, um, AmeriCorps members as full-time tutors in the schools. About 30% comes from the schools. They have skin in the game, and that includes funding uh, from uh, all of our school partners and in Del Valley, um, the additional commitment they've made to pay for their paraprofessionals, and then um, our support on top of that. 
And then 30% comes from um, traditional private sources, foundation, corporations, individuals. And so I invite you to invest in our work now, to join us, to come alongside us in this ambitious, but truly ultimately achievable vision that all children can become successful readers before third grade. Literacy First is very cost effective. Our traditional model, we can provide intensive daily support that the child needs um, using our AmeriCorps tutors for about $1,500 per student. Um, our cost in the model we're doing in Del Valley is less per student for that, but then the district has committed their, um, their funding to, the, to pay the paraprofessionals. Um, so there are several ways that you can give. If you gave us your phone number, you've received a text link to give online, or you can visit our website at literacyfirst.org forward slash donate, which will be in the chat box. It's not a live link, so you'll have to cut and paste it into your browser. And, and this gift does go to the University of Texas on our behalf. And I want to assure you that 100% of every gift comes directly to our program. Um, you also receive a follow-up email with these links and a recording um, of this webinar. So your financial support now will allow us to be able to meet the significant challenges ahead, to have the capacity to pivot, to build our staff capacity, and to really reach um, uh, for uh, a goal in which the majority of our students have likely lost more than a full year's growth in reading. And so I thank you for giving generously. We deeply appreciate our community of supporters and we look forward to staying in touch with you over the next several months. Thank you for making time to be with us today. And now I'll give you back to Marisol. Yes, and, and thank you, Mary Ellen, for all of your tireless work and ensuring that so many kids have access to the highest quality early literacy services. We're so lucky to have you in Austin. So thank you. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to our Literacy First staff and board, the event sponsors and organizers, and then to each of you for being here with us today and investing in Literacy First. We do hope that you learned something, you were inspired and compelled to give to this important work. So thank you so much. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.